So what is a memory exactly? A memory is a collection of storage locations. So it's a mass storage device and that we already know, but it's also a collection of storage locations that share a single port. There might be multiple ports in some, in some cases, and we will discuss this shortly, but in the simplest of cases, there is a single port that all the memory locations share. So what do we mean by a port? A port is a way in which we can access the memory locations. So forget about the distinction between reading and writing for now, just assume that we are only reading. And let's assume that each of these small squares is a storage location, which could be a normal register, normal CMOS register. Now, if all of these registers that we have here, there are eight registers, share a single bus, a single output bus, this data bus, and can be multiplexed using a single address bus, then we call this a single port memory. So what is a port again? A port is a collection of buses that can be used to access locations within the memory. All of the locations within the memory will share a single bus. A bus is generally distinguished by having a, a port will generally be distinguished by having the following buses. So a single port will contain the following. Data in, this is a multiple bit uh, bus its width is as wide as the uh, data that uh, is, is to be written to the memory is. And the data in bus contains the data that will be written to the memory in case the memory is read write. So uh, if we are marking the directions, this is an input port and it's a multi-bit port and it's called data in. The second bus is data out and this is the bus that will contain data that is read from the memory. And again, it's a multi-bit bus and it is, um, and it is a, um, an output bus. So this is data out. The third and most important uh, bus is the address bus. And this is an input bus. And again, it's multiple, multiple bits. And so this is the address bus. And this is the bus that indicates which location within the memory you are reading from or writing to. And so we have a single address bus. So we can't have two buses, one indicating writing and one indicating reading. So we have a single address bus. So we have to have a signal, some kind of input control that tells us whether we are reading or writing in the current cycle. And we usually call this write enable. So this is a single bit input, write enable. When it's asserted, then we are writing in the current cycle. When it's deasserted, then we are reading in the current cycle. And of course, there is a clock. Again, that's a single bit input um, signal. Now, clocks are optional because some memories are asynchronous. So you can read and write to them asynchronously, but this is impractical. Most practical memories are synchronous and will have a, uh, a provided clock. So the collection of all these buses together form what we call a single port. Not all memories have to have all these buses. So for example, we, we already said that the clock signal could or could not be present based on whether the memory is synchronous or asynchronous. Some memories don't have a data in or write enable. ROMs, for example. ROMs will not have a data in or write enable because they don't need them. They don't have writing. An SRAM or a DRAM will definitely have a, some form of write enable and data in. But what cannot be absent from a port is the address bus. So a port is actually distinguished by having an address bus. How many address buses we have de determines how many ports we have. And so if you look here, we have eight locations. Now these eight locations can be distinguished by an address bus that contains log base two, eight, and let's take the ceiling bits. So it's gonna be a three bit address bus. And we can see it here, right? It's a three bit bus. So this address line is going to take values from 0 to 8 uh, to 7, and based on what value is provided, 
to the address bus, we read the contents of whichever bit we are reading from. Okay. So we can see that this multiplexer plays a very important role. And we can call this multiplexer, in this case, the address decoder, because it takes in the address and it just determines which memory location we are trying to access. It's important to point out one thing here, which is that these locations, the squares here, do not have to be single bit locations. They could be st storing multiple bits. So this could be multiple bits. Just as long as every one of these locations is storing the same number of bits and it's the same size as the data bus. So if this is a 16 bit memory, so each of these locations will be storing 16 bits and this multiplexer will be an eight by one multiplexer, but it is a 12 bit 8 by 1 multiplexer, meaning that each of its inputs is 12 bits and its output is 12 bits and it's going to multiplex between the 8 12 bits. Now let's look at this memory which consists of um, the same 8 locations here but it contains two address decoders. So this is actually a two port memory. So this is port 1 and this is port 2. And this is a, an asynchronous read-only memory because we don't have a data in or write enable or clock. But why is it a two-port memory? What distinguishes the fact that it has two ports? Is it the fact that it has two data out buses? No, absolutely not. It's the fact that it has two address buses. And so this allows us to read from two independent memory locations simultaneously. So a port is defined by the presence of an address bus, which in turn indicates that there is an independent address decoder dedicated to this address bus. So ports immediately indicate the number of, of address decoders present, and they indicate the number of memory locations that we can independently access for either reading or writing. It could be uh, either or both reading or writing. So, for example, in a read-write memory, you could have multiple ports and some of the ports might be read-only or write-only or read-write, just as long as you have a, an independent address decoder for each of the independent uh, ports. Now, this way of arranging the memory, this is the memory core, actually. This is just, this is the memory core, and the rest of the thing here is decoders. Right. Now, this way of arranging the memory core is extremely inefficient because it's a linear memory ar array. So we are arranging the memory locations, the storage locations in a single file or a single line. Now, this is inefficient because typical memories are not eight bits or eight words long. They are millions, if not billions of, of, uh, of bits or words uh, long. And so if we imagine that you have a huge memory uh, containing multiple, multiple millions of locations, what's going to happen to the memory is that it's going to have a very strange aspect ratio. It's going to be much, much longer than it is wide. And this is going to make its layout a nightmare. And for memories, we are going to care a lot about the layout because the layout indicates density. But a layout that looks like this, even if it is dense, even if the absolute area that it occupies is good, is still not practical because it's going to have a very large dimension and a very small dimension. And you have a chip. When you have a chip, that chip has a floor plan. And you're supposed to, uh, 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 you're supposed to put different modules in different locations. So if the memory looks something like this, what are you going to do? Where are you going to put it? You can't really make the chip larger so that just so that it can accommodate the memory. You can't even make the chip accommodate the aspect ratio of the memory because the aspect ratio is going to be ridiculous and it's going to make the chip more expensive for no reason at all. And so practical memories are actually square arrays. So we have a square array instead of a linear array. So we have here an array of wires running vertically and horizontally. The vertical wires are called bit lines and the horizontal wires are called word lines. And at the intersection of every bit line and a word line, you will find a cell. This cell could contain a zero or a one. 
but every intersection between a word line and a bit line is a cell regardless of what it contains or if it contains anything at all. It is still a cell. So if we have um, 2 power k word lines and 2 power m bit lines, then this memory contains 2 power k times 2 power m locations and it is a 2 power k plus m bit memory. So this is the size of the memory. Now, if we have 2 power k word lines, then these word lines can be uh, decoded using a k times 2 power k decoder. And we call this the row decoder because it decodes between the different row lines or the different word lines. Similarly, if we have 2 power m bit lines, then we need a 2 power m times 1 column decoder. And we call it a column decoder because it decodes between the different columns. So the reading operation generally starts by providing a new address to the memory array. This address is going to consist of k plus m bits. The array is going to divide this into k bits that it gives to the address to the row decoder and m bits that it gives to the column decoder. First, the k bits go to the row decoder and the row decoder is an actual decoder. So that means that it is a uh, logic element which has uh, k inputs and provides 2 power k output lines. So it provides exponentially more in outputs than it has inputs. And the outputs are distinguished by the fact that only one of them is active at a time, you know, in the simplest implementation. So right here, we're going to provide k bits to the row decoder. It's going to decode them and it's going to decide which row exactly we want to access. And it's going to enable only the row that we want to access. Let's say that it's this row. So it's going to enable the entire row of elements. And so we are going to read values from each and every cell in that row. So we're going to read outputs on M bit lines. So there will be outputs on M bit lines. But we only want to read one of these M outputs. So what's going to happen here is that we have to have a circuit element that picks only one out of the uh, 2 power M bit lines. So what does pick one out of 2 power something? A multiplexer. So this is a multiplexer. The column decoder is actually a multiplexer. It takes in 2 power M bit lines and produces a single output line which is the data output bus that we use uh, to read from the memory. So the column decoder is actually a multiplexer. This is a misnomer. We call it a column decoder, but it's actually a multiplexer. But that's OK because, you know, people are used to calling it a column decoder. And just for the fact that both the column decoder and the row decoder combined form an address decoder. So when we talked about an address decoder here, it was actually a multiplexer. Here we have two parts of the to the decoder, one of them horizontal and one vertical, one of them is a multiplexer and one of them is a true decoder. We see other accessory um, elements to the array here. So the array actually consists of two parts, the core, which is the storage elements, which are cells. And this is what distinguishes memories from random logic, is that the majority of the array actually consists of repeated elements. So each and every cell is going to look exactly the, like the ones uh, next to it. So we have to make a huge effort in the design of a specific cell. So we, we spend a lot of time designing a cell because everything that comes out of this cell is going to be repeated 2 power m plus k times. So if you reduce the area of the cell even by a little bit, that's going to show up as a large reduction in the array as a whole. Now. In addition to the uh, core, there are accessory circuits. We have already discussed the row decoder and the column decoder as two very important accessories. Uh, here we can see two other accessories, the sense amplifiers and the buffers. The buffers are used in uh, read-write memories, and they are used to drive the values of the column decoders to specific values when we are writing. So when you are ri writing, you need the column decoders to be actively driven by low impedance nodes so that you can change the values stored in cells. And the uh, buffer does this. We'll spend some time discussing buffer design 
uh, later in this module. Sense amplifiers are extremely important and we will discuss them in detail. But what they do is they resolve a fundamental contradiction about the cell design. So we need cells to be small because density is really important to memories. On the other hand, if the cell is small, it has a um, reduced ability to drive the huge capacitance of the columns or the bit lines. And speed is also important for memories. So what do we do if we make the cells bigger so that they can drive the columns faster? That reduces density. If we increase density, that increases delay. So sense amplifiers help um, resolve this conflict and they do so in such an ingenious way that it's actually going to be a lot of fun discussing them. Now, one more thing is that uh, when you have practical memories, like real memories, they're going to consist of multiple um, square arrays. We call each of them a core. And these multiple arrays can then have one more level of multiplexing or decoding between them called the bank selection level. And you can imagine that you can even have a square array of uh, square arrays. So you have an array of arrays and that helps reduce the delay a little bit by making, because we will find that the delay of memories is actually uh, more or less contingent on the length of the columns and the, and the rows, on the length of the word lines and the bit lines. And so in practical arrays, it helps to divide them into smaller arrays to keep the length of bit lines and word lines limited.